I've always enjoyed my private conversations with the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, and I knew the importance he attached to Darwin's theory of evolution in the development of disbelief. So I asked him why he'd called his book Darwin's Dangerous Idea. And one of the points he made was simply that the theory of evolution was easy to understand, and that's what made it so dangerously subversive. Unlike some other great scientific advances, going back to Newton or certainly Einstein or, or best case, perhaps quantum theory, unlike these bizarre revolutions, uh, I think that Darwin's theory is really quite easy to understand. It, it, you don't need any math. The basic idea is so simple that you have variation, that inevitably, if there's variation in the population, some are going to be better than others, and the ones that are better than others are going to have more kids than the ones, uh, than the less favored ones, and the, and the offspring are going to resemble their parents. That gives you this little ratchet. And indeed, the idea that you could do that much lifting with a simple ratchet is, is a stunner. And most of the skepticism uh, has been along the lines of, well, there's just too much work to be done by such a simple process. But time and again, it's been shown, no, there's enough time. The process is more powerful than you might think. But you can understand um, why it was that uh, at the beginning, these minute ratchets, minute teeth on the ratchet, mm -hmm. would have been seen as um, implausible uh, contributions to something which was an adaptation. What I'm interested in is, why do you think it was that Darwin's idea was seen as so dangerous rather than simply nonsensical? For the first 50 years, um, there wasn't enough information to make Darwin's idea anything other than um, implausible and irreverent. Why was it seen as so dangerous at that time? Well, in spite of Darwin's best efforts, the implications were there for anybody to draw, and that is, he's not just talking about birds and bees and flowers, he's talking about us. He's talking about our minds, he's talking about our conscience, our soul. Everything, if Darwin is right, is made up of little ratchets doing their little ratchety thing. And it's all just mechanical and blind and purposeless at the bottom. And this was the great inversion, because until then, the idea that, that there was something like a life force, élan vital, or that there was something like a, like a soul that was completely distinguished, di uh, distinct from matter, and that it somehow informed and controlled and guided creative processes, thinking processes, moral reasoning, and so forth. This top-down idea about morality and self and soul was very plausible until Darwin. And after Darwin, people could see that maybe the soul could be replaced with some of those ratchets. And that's a very threatening idea. So if Darwin had not produced this dangerous idea, do you think that uh, the the development of infidelity, atheism, or disbelief, or however one wants to call it, would have been uh, delayed? I suppose that's a historical question that one should do very careful research on, and I haven't. But it seems very plausible to me that it was Darwin that, that, that broke the dam. Because before Darwin, <coughs> there really wasn't a good answer to the question, how did this come to be? How did this bird with this wonderful wing, how did it come into existence? If not by some divine act of creation. The, the rhetorical question, what else could it be, had no answer. That was what William Paley had said. And I think it's important to realize that Paley's argument from design is actually very, very powerful. It challenges any thinker to come up with an alternative. And Darwin called his bluff. He didn't deny the Paley argument. He said, I'm going to meet it head on. Yes, there's fantastic design in the biosphere. 
And I'm going to show you how you can get that design without a designer. However, e even if Darwin had succeeded in demonstrating how you can get the illusion of design without having to postulate the existence of a designer, it's still hard to resolve the problem of the relationship between minds and brains. So the philosophers, like Descartes, for example, had long ago insisted that the brain and mind were entirely separate. And even now, there's a persistent belief that the mind, the soul, or whatever you want to call it, has an immaterial existence. Well, Daniel Dennett has written eloquently about the problem of consciousness. So I asked him about Darwin's attitude to this problem. Why was it that, uh, that Descartes was able to preserve the immaterial soul, and Darwin somehow felt albeit a Christian, that he did not uh, uh, feel it possible to, uh, to preserve a, a comparable sanctuary? Ah, uh, that's a good question, and especially because Wallace was able to make precisely the Cartesian move. Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection, said that it covered everything up to the human soul. And he drew the line there, exactly where Descartes drew the line. Wallace said, no, we have to make an exception for the human mind. And uh, Darwin famously wrote him a letter saying, I, th I think you, you, you will kill our, our child. Darwin, to Darwin, it was clear that the, that the Cartesian stop, the, the Maginot line, was, was indefensible, simply because it was clear that we're primates, we're, we're mammals. The, the continuity of nature was not going to permit one species on the planet to have miracle stuff in its brain when no other species did. I was once interviewed in Italy, and the headline of the interview the next day was, was wonderful. I saved this for my collection. It was, uh, Si, abbiamo un'anima. Ma è fatta di tanti piccoli robot. Yes, we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. And I thought, exactly right. Yes, we have a soul, but it's mechanical. But it's still a soul. It still does the work that the soul was supposed to do. It is the seat of reason. It is the seat of moral responsibility. It's why we are appropriate objects of punishment when we do evil things, why we deserve the praise when we do good things. It's just not a mysterious lump of wonder stuff. Which will outlive us. Which will outlive us, yes. We, have to, we do have to give that up. And I'm sure that that's a big part of the uh, inexhaustible appeal of the idea of a soul. Uh, all you have to confront is the task of consoling a child whose parent has died. And the natural appeal of the idea of a, of a soul that goes on living is it's just undeniable. It takes a strong person indeed to not to avail himself of that crutch when responding to a child who's just facing the, the loss of a loved one. Uh, or indeed an adult facing the loss of a loved adult as well. Sure, I mean, sure. The loss of anyone. So that, sure. Um,